On this episode of the Pats Podcast, we're talking about bands, and I don't mean that garage band you started in high school. Stick around. Let's be better athletic trainers. <laughs> Before we start, I want to thank today's sponsor, Sway Medical, for the support of the Pats Podcast and athletic trainers in the state of Pennsylvania. For more information, contact them at www.swaymedical.com. Dr. Geisler, thank you for carving some time out today to come talk to us about your research in IT band impingement. Uh, let's start with a little bit about yourself, uh, where you went to school, where you work, and how you got into the topic of IT band. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's my first podcast, so this is exciting. Uh, nice. So I am currently uh, the Associate Dean of Health Sciences at Simmons University in Boston, but I was a program director of accredited AT programs at two different institutions, Georgia Southern University and Ithaca College for the last 23 years, and I was a clinician for about 10 years at high schools and clinics, PT clinics in Orlando and North Carolina and, and Virginia for a while before I got an academic. So kind of a wanderer. Uh, I went to school at Marietta College in Ohio, got my bachelor's in sports medicine there and my master's in Chapel Hill and then my doctorate at Georgia Southern University in education as part of my journey uh, to where I am now. As far as IT band goes, uh, the interest is kind of a weird, uh, a weird source. Um, I, I guess I gave a lot of credit to Craig Denegar, Dr. Craig Denegar from University of Connecticut, who did a, a great uh, kind of case study presentation at EATA some time ago, <clears throat> and admitting that he had, you know, pretty much been a failure uh, for a long time. You know, he's a PTAT, PhD, big time researcher, highly accomplished. Uh, so he was admitting that he had struggles with treating IT band, and he had to take a different approach. And so that kind of sparked my uh, recollection from my clinical experiences with the same failures and looking back when I was active clinically I, I don't think I was ever able to get an IT band patient well again and so it kind of forced that reflection of going back and, and looking at okay well what do I know about it and of course what I knew about it was what I w was taught way back in the early 1980s uh, at Marietta about uh, the anatomy and, and the, the pathoetiology and, and the treatment so it kind of opened up this big can of worms of uh, what do we know? What's the evidence say? And, and can we do something different? I was um, awesome. I, I was really excited when I read your article because everything, everything that you pointed out absolutely just defined my experience with IT bands. Stretching never helped. Um, cross friction massage, which was really kind of honed in on us, uh, at least in undergrad where I went to, you know, that's a good treatment. I've never really been able to rehab an athlete out of it. Um, using those techniques. And it was kind of one of those injuries that when, when I, when I came upon it, it was just like, okay, let's refer you to the physician because I, I have no success. And I always thought it was me. Yeah. Well, you know, the old model, and I'm kind of one of these guys that like to look at paradigms or, or axioms, you know, which is how we practice and, and dig them into them and see if they make sense. And so this whole kind of presentation from Dr. Danagar and then reflection on my practice kind of forced me to do an archaeological dig. And actually in the article you referenced, I tried to use the word archaeological perspective and I, it got jettisoned by the reviewers. They were like, what? What's this? I was like, well, I'm going and digging up information to see if it's true. A little Indiana Jones, which I guess is another one coming out. So maybe I was a little ahead of my times there. But you know, the old paradigm that started in the 70s kind of made sense, but it was based off of uh, a limited understanding of the anatomy, which I'll look back to in a second, which didn't need to be limited because there actually was information there. So it was kind of partial. And, you know, that was the day before we had all these amazing scientists in labs doing these three dimensional high speed biomechanical studies of gate mechanics and runner mechanics and those sorts of things. And before we knew much about fascial tissue, and, and to be honest, we didn't really know much about the IT band. So if you think about what I was taught, again, I graduated in 1987, so date myself a wee bit, but it was a really simplistic presentation of the problem. IT band inserts on Gertie's tubercle, right, singularly, that's mm -hmm. the only thing it does. Uh, and if, if the IT band is tight, you can do an Obers test. And if the Obers test is positive, it tells you the IT band is tight. And if it's tight, it's going to roll over the lateral femoral epicondyle. And so if you're running, it's going to cause friction. And it makes sense, right? Like a, a, a rope being rubbed across the edge of a rock, right? It's like, oh, well, that makes sense. You can kind of envision this hot inflamed IT band. And the other part of the model was that there was a bursa there, right? We taught that bursas are in places where there's friction or compression. 
to decrease, you know, uh, forces upon other vital soft tissues. So it made pretty, pretty good sense. So the, the theory of, of diagnosing it was, you know, the Nobles test, which means you push on it, mm -hmm. right? The hot spot, you palpate it and then flex and extend the knee through a short range of motion, 20, 30 degrees of flexion. It's like, oh, yeah, that hurts. Okay, it's positive Nobles. Then you do an Obers. Oh, yeah, it's tight. It must be tight and therefore it's rolling over. Well, if you actually think about it for a second, like, like I did, if that were the case, right? If the rollover friction model was true, everybody that ran or cycled or jumped for a living would be walking around with bilateral IT band pain syndromes. That's the first thing that popped in my head. It's like, why don't, why isn't this much, much higher? And, you know, the evidence is like between two and 52% of, of running base athletes get IT band pain. Well, that's a huge range, right? <laughs> so that doesn't really help us much. But it was first noticed in, in military athletes, right? In the 70s out in San Diego, right? Where, where Rennie first kind of proposed this model, making 78, and then it was added to. Um, so it, it kind of made sense. But so to your point, Phil, about treatment, so we, we do deep friction, right? And I literally remember doing this, and, and Dr. Denninger said this, you remember sticking your elbow in someone's IT band and they're writhing in pain? And it's like, gosh, I feel better. I'm like, well, no, it really hurts. Well, no kidding, because you're, you're compressing some kind of inflamed tissue. And then because it rolls over, we'd strap it down. And I remember using that patellofemoral tape that rips all your hair off, right? <laughs> strap it on around the leg. There's actually an IT band band. Like if you Google, go into Google Photos and put IT band strap, there's yep. an IT pan strap that looks just like the choke pad straps, yep. right? Yep. So let's strap that sucker down. Let's stretch the hell out of it. Let's do friction massage and see if the inflammation pain goes away. Guess what? It, it doesn't. Didn't. So that's kind of a, a synopsis of the, the archaeological historical part, which incidentally, you know, the, the, some reviewers wanted to cut that. Uh, when I first when I first submitted the version of this paper, I'm like, well, to me, it's really, really important because it, it helps outline how we've gotten to where we are, right? Which hence the archeological part, right? To the paradigm of practice that many of us still use today in this and other 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 manners, right? Is, is faulty. So to me, the new evidence that's a synthesis put together things of anatomy, MRI, cadaver studies, surgical studies, biomechanical studies, outcome studies, kind of trying to bring all that together makes more sense if you look at where we came from. I know that was uh, that was part yeah. of the article that really kind of drew me in to uh, to finish through it. It it really did kind of drive in that when you finally got to like the newer research part of it, it it really did make sense because we were able to pull in at least I was what I used to do, and then the findings that I the results that I had at least in current memory previously. Um, it really um, it was a very in, engaging article. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's the hard part. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I, I echo what Phil says. And I'll, I'll say this, you know, I didn't when I saw the article, I was excited um, mainly because this is something that like the, the I think it was Chandler in 2007 that came out and said the, the mathematical model that showed that you need to be, you know, this ridiculous amount of force into the IT band to actually, you know, have it stretch and lengthen at all. Um, I've been aware of that for, you know, since probably 2008, maybe 2009. I don't remember when I, I, I first was um, introduced to it, but it's it's that thought that there are folks that are out there that are still trying to stretch this thing. And this IT band is just so thick and just basically immovable that why are we still trying to stretch it? I think the, the, the whole old school thought that you went over can also be, um, you know, the same thought process we have with other injuries, right? And and that's why I really wanted to bring you on to talk about this was the fact that, you know, I think we need to get better at looking away from the injury at all of injuries, right? Not just IT band, but also, you know, any type of patellofemoral pain, chin splints, whatever it is, we need to stop looking at just the, the local structures and start looking more broadly at the whole system, right? Um, that being said, do you want to maybe, is there any other anatomy or the biomechanics that you want to talk about that are important to the injury? You know, what what maybe the mechanics are before we talk about the pathomechanics, um, or you can jump right into to what we're looking at with more of the, the pathology as well. Absolutely. Well, first I'll, I'll comment on your, your great insight there, Adam. It's these complex problems require a complex approach, right? And complicated but complex from the standpoint of system yeah. theory, right? So some yes. people, have criticized, so I've already gotten some criticism in the article. They say, well, there's not enough evidence and it's not absolute. And, and, and I'm not saying this is the only thing that happens. So whether it's MTSS or telephone pain syndrome, right? And I've always taught this to my students. When you see the word syndrome, athletic pedalogy syndrome, shoulder impingement syndrome, 
uh, it tells you that it's complicated, right? And so context is very, very important and it's, it's multifactorial. And if you're a cis thinker, you, you work off the belief that you can't analyze one factor within that problem by itself because it's interconnected to the other factors, right? Yes, so, yes. You know, Pez planus, if someone does hyperonate, it, it, that can add to it. There are studies, right? Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult. And that's the problem with kind of reductionist controlled studies is you're trying to eliminate all of the possibilities to identify one possibility. That's the limitation to that kind of science. Again, it's needed, yep. it's important, but we have to take that for what it's worth and put it kind of to the side and then ask yourself, what other factors are there? And then something like this, this dynamic, AKA during running based sports, right? There are numerous variables. So um, this, I also learned a couple interesting things, which is the cool part of doing this kind of research, which is kind of the way I kind of scholarship that I do. One, humans are the only ones that have an IT net. Two is we don't have one at birth, right? It develops through walking. But if yeah. you look at Kaplan's definition back in the 50s, and he actually wrote a paper on this and he presented it at the American Orthopedic Society meeting in West Virginia in 1958, he identified these deeper fibers and more complicated IT band and insertional anatomy than just Grady's tubercle. But it got it got buried. Nobody actually realized that it. And we we all kind of and I remember in my BOC exam in 1987, I had to palpate Grady's tubercle for the old practical. I don't know if you guys are old enough to have still done the oral practical or if it was gone by the time. Yep. I, 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 I was like the last year. Yep. Oh, yeah. So I remember Palpan and Guru's tubercle and, and I thinking, OK, what's the point? Right. And I and I taught that for years, too. Right. So it kind of comes back to the educational thing because you're afraid your students are going to get that wrong. It's like, here's Guru's tubercle. Right. So now when I teach this stuff, I said, here's Guru's tubercle. Right. And because you, you may get it on your BOC exam. Right. And I don't want you to miss that because it's easy. But. It's an oversimplification of a complex system space thing. And the IT band now we know has multiple insertions, multiple layers, multiple locations. And in 2019, matter of fact, a, a fantastic uh, anatomical dissection study came out that showed uh, by Godin, 2017, excuse me, and it actually called them Kaplan fibers. And I dug around and I can't find it, but obviously it's a tribute to Kaplan's paper in 1958. And then I found them in the cadaver lab. And it, go to that article, American Journal of Sports Medicine, 2017. It's an amazing pictures of these really, really strong rope-like fibers, the proximal one and a distal one, that insert in Kaplan's ridges. So now we have two Kaplan's ridges on the femur, two Kaplan's ligaments that are in the undersurface of the IT band, which suggests that there's no way the IT band can roll over the lateral form of a condyle because they're strapped down. Then if you look at Vieira's work from Brazil, in 2007, right? So we had this model up to about the early 200s. And then Faircloth had two great studies in 06 and Vieira's model from Port uh, Brazil in 2007. They started to show how complicated the insertional anatomy of the IT band is. Multiple locations on the linear spare on the femur itself, in the lateral retinaculum of the, of the patellofemoral joint, obviously through Gertie's tubercle. And now you're looking at the IT band studies being done on connection with the anterior uh, ligament, the new in preventing tibial translation, right? So actually rotary oh, and interiors, right? So I didn't even go there. That's a whole nother level of complexity. Mm -hmm. So what we know through these studies is number one, there is no bursa. Nobody's found a bursa through MRI, through surgery and through cadaver. So that part's gone, right? So if it's not a bursa, that can't be the pain source. <laughs> it's just, it's not there. Right? So <laughs> number, number two, the insertional anatomy is much more complicated than we thought. So the rollover is probably not, not going to happen. Number three, to your point, um, it doesn't stretch. You can only stretch it like 0.15%, right? And so some other studies, and this is where I'm, I'm not an expert in, and I had some help from Todd Lazenby, helped me publish this article on IJATT first about five years prior. He's a big fascia guy. It's actually strain rate. So if you think about taking a rubber band, right, a nice healthy rubber band, a new one, right? And if you stretch it out real slow and hold it there, right, that's, that's magnitude. How far can you stretch that out before you alter the properties of, of the rubber band? Well, what the studies that I've done, if I understand it correctly, it's more about rate. It's how quickly you, you pull those two parts of the band apart, and then, then what does that happen? So if you think about the stand phase of gait, right, and what fascias roll in, and the IT band is largely fascial <clears throat> tissue, roll in absorbing and transmitting energy, right? It's really a load absorption problem. So you think about, you know, we have this idea of normal gait, which is being challenged too, right? Um, but those of us in the field who've studied gait a long time, we can't help but Walk, watch people at the mall or walking on the street and we see their gate like, oh, that must hurt. And look at that swing out, right? It must give her some knee pain or hip pain, right? But if you look at um, 
the the dynamic loading part of gait, right, which is 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, right, in the in the um, sagittal plane, right? You you need dorsiflexion in the ankle, you need 20, 30 degrees of flexion in the knee, you need 15, 20 degrees of, of the hip. And again, there's ranges based on on the way people move, body size, surface, et cetera. Right. Those are all parts of the complexity issue. Right. Well, muscles during landing, just like from a jump job is to eccentrically and the fastest job is to work with the muscles eccentrically to absorb that energy well if you have variations in the planar movements right it changes that that process so kaplan described the deltoid in 58 as the delta excuse me the the it band as the deltoid of the hip right which was pretty cool thought but you got to go a little deeper to truly understand that so if we think of the deltoid of the shoulder right most of what we do with the, the deltoid of the shoulder is open chain concentric right the deltoids are active if you're doing push-ups and press-ups right to kind of stabilize the glenohumeral joint but i haven't seen anybody really really study that because we're paying attention to the cuff and the biceps and the scapular muscles etc but if you think about the deltoid hip it's totally different its job is what i call isoeccentrically right so it has to work isoeccentrically. And again, that term got thrown out from the paper because I wanted to introduce that as well. It has to work isoeccentrically during the stance phase of gait, which is closed chain, to control the femur. So these new biomechanical studies, numerous biomechanical studies, including a couple of award-winning papers, are looking at the role of the deltoid of the hip, the gluteus maximus, the tensor fascia lata, and the external rotators of the hip, which often get, gets kind of left out of the conversation. So if you look at about dynamic valgus collapse, right, microscopic, micro, not macro, right? A lot of people talk about macro with ACL risk and telefemoral instabilities, right? Collapse, boom, bada bing, bada boom. Well, this is a micro level. And what do we do with, with anterior chronic compartment syndrome, diagnose them? We put them on the treadmill, right? We have them run 10, 12, 15 minutes. We ask them, okay, tell me when your pain comes. And then if we're doing the pressure study, they, they do the pressure study once the pain comes up and they take a reading, right? Well, that's the same thing here. So it's a micro problem and people start to complain of the knee pain 15, 20 minutes into the run where the hip muscles are latent or slow or lazy or fatigued, some combination thereof. It starts to allow this microscopic drift of the femur into the frontal plane. So you have a little bit of femoral adduction, a little bit of femoral internal rotation, right? That's a failure of the isoeccentric capacity of the muscles. And I say isoeccentric because there's there's this kind of small window between the muscles work kind of isometrically to stabilize something and then working eccentrically to prevent movement out of that position, if that makes any sense, right? And so if we go back to uh, strain rate, right? The more... If, uh, you know, if you're talking five to eight degrees of femoral adduction and rotation, right, medial line, medial drift of the femur, the faster that happens and the more that happens, the more you're getting that strain rate on the IT band, probably causing some, some issues with that. But where Faircloth and Vieira and some of the other biomechanicals that have gone is that that allows the IT band to compress up against the lateral femoral epicondyle not to friction over forward and aft, but to compress up against it. And what we now know underneath there is a highly innervated fat pad, which causes parainflammation, which has been described in the, in the fat pads around the Achilles and around the patellar tendon. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, a great example that I've used past with the, that strain rate, like you were talking about with the rubber band, is silly putty. If you take silly putty and you go really slow, it'll it'll stretch. Whereas if you take silly putty and try to rip it very quickly, that strain, that magnitude, the the, the time of it is it, it just snaps, right? It it now becomes like a piece of paper and, and, and snaps in half. So I always thought that was a good representation of that. I think is what I'm trying to explain with that. Um, yeah. That being said, so you know. What I'm hearing the the patho anatomy or, or patho mechanics that we're looking at here is is more in that um, uh, would would you call it more in the early or mid stance where you're you're, you're getting that iso eccentric so that yielding or that eccentric where you're trying to give um, and and you're blaming that on the the um, weakness or timing or fatigue of the the lateral musculature of the hip so glutes glute minimus yeah. medium medius uh, external rotators all that that is trying to prevent the the femur from going into internal rotation and adduction yeah yeah it's that early to mid stage going from 20 to 30 degrees right so if it, if it all occurs in the sagittal plane there's less uh there, there are less accommodations to account for but the more drift that you get out of that plane right the more accommodations so not only do you drift into that to the to the midline right 
excuse me, but think of it too, you have to drift out of it, right? So we've seen people with major valgus collapse when they run, you know, the, the double kind of wing out when, they, when they're in the open chain swing phase and you, you're like, oh God, that must hurt. But there's some people that run like that and have no problem whatsoever, right? Right. So it's not all about absolutes. But it, the more someone drifts into midplane, the more they have to kind of drift out of it to then kind of put the accelerators. When you go from decel to excel, when you go from absorption mm -hmm. to propulsion, right? so it also compromises your propulsory ca uh, capabilities. So there's there there's there's part of that problem. But to add other things to the complexity, right? If someone has, um, you know, antiverted hips. Right. If, if someone has uh, genu valgum genu verum, which is structural, right? If someone has pes planus, pes cavus, to, to any degree, that's why you'd have to have like 3,000 people in a study to control for all those variables to get absolute outcomes and say, aha, this is the only way to do it. Now, there are a couple of things to consider, right? If you're evaluating someone with lateral idiopathic, you know, slow evolving knee pain and a running based athlete or a jumping based athlete, you, you have, there's two other things that have been noted in the literature. One is an extra synovial pouch. Uh, it's like an, like a hypertrophic synovial out pouch from the synovium of the knee. And two is an intraarticular fibroma of the tendon sheath. Now those are both pretty rare, but they also cause a lot of pain. But they, the difference is they also give like a, a me more mechanical symptoms. Uh, patients report a sense of fullness or clicking or uh, you know, something mechanical. So those can be removed surgically. And so those should be ruled out. But most tendon sheets occur in the hand uh, and they're more common in women. So to have them in males in the knee is fairly uncommon, not, not, not outside the, the realm of possibilities, but those two things should be ruled out um, before you just jump to, um, you know, it's okay, this is a fat pad and it's biomechanically induced and, and those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, a great study came out in American Journal Sports Medicine by Willett in, um, uh, 2019, uh, right after I published my first paper, uh, that destroyed any diagnostic accuracy to the Obers test because they did uh, progressive resections of the IT band and the glute medius and the in the in the, uh, the fascia lata and hip capsule, and demonstrated pretty pretty strongly that the, the Obers test has nothing to do with IT band limitations. So throw that out. There's no diagnostic accuracy. Right? No one's ever studied it. Um, that's not really useful clinically. You can still do it, but I wouldn't use the results for anything. Yeah, yeah. So um, what I'm hearing there, would you agree or, or what are your thoughts on, you know, those, those differential diagnoses to me all sound like the same problem, but just the, the stress manifesting at a different area. So you have like a lateral compression of the knee, right? So you still have that, that adduction internal rotation that's causing lateral compression. And it's just, instead of the IT band getting mad, now we have either the synovial sheath or the, um, or the tendon sheath or the synovial, I, I'm not sure how you said pouch. that, but pouch. Yeah. Um, so to me, like you, you have that, you know, compression there, you're going to, there's fluid inside the knee. It's going to have to go somewhere. If you're compressing it, it's, it could, you know, pop out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to rule out those two things, right? You got to rule out, you know, arthritis, arthritis at a lateral compartment in the knee possible degenerative, you know, meniscal lesions or degenerations at a certain level, right? So you're looking at age and history and volume, those sorts of things. So once you've gone through your normal history and ruling out of other nefarious things, and you, you come up with with this vagary, right, for, if we kind of use that as a holding point, um, then you can look at their, their movement. And so you can videotape with your phone, them walking on a treadmill and then running and then watch them 10, 12, 15 minutes later and start to look for that knee window that I described in the article. And if you start to see them, their knees start to come together, the window getting smaller with fatigue of the hip muscles, right, that's what's going on. They can no longer prevent that valgus collapse, that microscopic and only talking five to seven degrees, which is kind of hard to see with your eyes. Yeah. But with our cell phones now in slow motion, you, you don't have to have a three-dimensional lab. And so then you do your normal things about decreasing their load. Right? Uh, Cochrane evidence shows that if you catch it early, if someone has a really hot, you know, lateral knee, inflamed fat pad, that um, steroids may do some, may provide some help. But if you, it's, they've had it for at least two weeks, then eh, not going to help so much. So you do the normal shutdown protection phase uh, and then slow return. But what you have to be able to do is get them from, you know, open chain exercises to turn those hip muscles on again, right? And try to mimic the positioning and then get them eventually to, to progressive stage closed chain loading before you return them back to play. And one of the 
one of the key things too that's fun about this if you think about how we how we assess hip muscles right kendall's and mt positions and techniques right that we pretty much don't do them in a lot of times in functional positions if we're doing them according to the book, right? So if you look at the hip abductors, side lying, neutral degree of hip flexion, straight knee, adduct 30 degrees, and we our hand has to be at the knee, probably on the compression point, right? So it <laughs> might hurt them, right? But that's not very functional. Number one, because it's open chain, right? How often do we do we abduct our hips 30, 40 degrees in normal life, unless we're a dancer, right? If we're, if we're an ice skater, right? So those are different functional demands. But for the normal person, it's not a very functional MMT. So if you actually put the hip in about 20 degrees of flexion and put the knee about 20 degrees of flexion and then do the MMT actually slightly adducted because we know the legs slightly adduct their stance phase of gait, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So put it in a more functional position and then do it and do repeated measures, do three or four. And if you see them give out on the affected side, right, in the second and third rep, you're inducing fatigue. So play around with our, the things we've learned from a, an assessment standpoint, make them more contextual, make them more real to the problem that you're looking at, and you might find some results. And that goes to the treat and the intervention part, right? A lot of people start with clams, sideline clams. Well, in the classic sideline clam, you know, with T-band around your knees, you're in about 45 degrees of hip flexion. Well, that's not functional either. Again, doesn't mean EMGs are typically done, right? Studies, and I, that's the main thing I added to this paper was all the intervention stuff that I didn't have in the IGTT paper, right? So th what's the best evidence for EMG and for outcomes? But start to look at functionality of that isoecentric capacity during the stance phase of gait. That's when the muscle has to be awake, alive, to prevent that femoral drift. I'm curious... Um this wasn't in the article and just if you if you had thought about this at all or, or seen anything but i know with acls um they there wasn't at least one article that came out that showed that a lack of internal rotation at the hip would be a um, possible cause of the valgus collapse at the knee thing with the it band and a similar you know if you're if you lack ir and and, and adduction at the hip you know are you going to make up for it at the knee well, I haven't seen anything on that, but I, I think my brain thinks that way, right? It's systems yeah. approach, right? If you have a compromise in one link in the chain and you have enough volume of strain and stress, aka running, uh, distance runner, right? Some other link in the chain has to pick up the stress. And sometimes it doesn't matter. People do it, it adapts. But if we're a little older, if we have old injuries, you know, with scar tissue and, you know, maybe we didn't manage, you know, maybe we have a history of hamstring strains or hip flexor strains or quad strains, right? And then we've got all the scar tissue. And so if our overall you know, link based function is compromised. Well, if you have a rusty link in a chain on your bike, you're going to hear it click every single time you go around event and you can ignore it, but eventually that chain's going to break at the weak point. So I, I yeah, that's the system based approach where you use your eyes and you look up and down the chain and, and, and you see, okay, can I fix that? Can I address it? If it's, you know, if it's cause they have retroverted hips, right. Or um, retroverted femurs um, or, or retroverted acetabulum, right, you're not going to be able to give them increased internal rotation because it's not capsular or soft tissue. So right. you're like, okay, I can't, I can't fix that. I got to work around it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, again, kind of going back to the um, those folks that look just awful when they run and, and move, and yet don't have pain. Um, thoughts about that? You know, graded exposure. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, outliers. You know. Um, we, we want to put everything into normal, right? And then again, I remember learning all this uber detail phases of gait, you know, heel and then this and then mid and then this happens and this unlocks and like, you know, until I really became, and I used to do that when I'd watch, and that was before we had cell phone cameras and we used to set up running labs with, with old fashioned video cassette recorders right on our shoulders and tripods and having people run and then analyzing, oh my God, they do this. Right. We now know that's not a lot of validity to that. <clears throat> and there's, there are different ways of, you know, heel rockers, ankle rockers and four foot rockers is one more simple way, more effective way to look at it. But, yeah, you know, um, people without pain don't come don't come and see you. But we also know that runners deal with a lot of pain before they come see you. Right. Yeah. And you, yeah. the first thing you want to say is, man, if you'd come to me with this six months ago, I probably could have fixed it in three weeks. But now you've got secondary chronic inflammation and tissue changes. And whew, right? oh, but I got a big marathon coming up in three weeks. Fix it. Like, eh. 
So <laughs> there's a great source uh, called Running Physio Tutors or Physio Running Tutors or Running Physios, I think, out of Australia that uh, has a great presence on YouTube and on Twitter. Um, he actually grabbed this article and put a whole episode together, which is pretty cool. Uh, cool. But they they do a really nice job addressing uh, some really advanced evidence based and kind of systems based science on, on running injuries that I would refer anybody that's interested in more uh, AT uh, running based science uh, to, to look yeah. at. Awesome. Awesome. Phil, what do you got? Um, I was interested to hear about any modalities that you found more successful than the others to help um, manage uh, the discomfort and help uh, promote healing. Uh, I'm not a modalities guy. I kind of, when I was still active clinically, started getting away from modalities uh, pretty much. Um, this is going back to before I started Ithaca College, when I was taking care of the baseball team at Georgia Southern. And I just started noticing that, I, I questioning, you know, what were they really doing? And um, so I started minimizing my use of modalities. In my review of Lit on this, uh, nothing seems to work except for short-term nonsense if you catch it within two weeks, based on the Cochrane uh, database. So there was no other outcomes um, studies that showed significant changes with some in the time IT band, either friction, again, old model or impingement, new model sy symptoms for a period, you know, period of time of over two to three weeks. So it's a matter of quieting it down, uh, protecting and resting, progressive loading, whatever model you like to follow. And then I outline that in phase one, level one, level two, level three kind of return. So I think just uh, rest from the insulting activity uh, and modifications and be careful, you know, because a lot of people, when they do this, they automatically put them on a bike or they put them on a, a stair stepper or one of those other kind of uh, machines. If they still have the propensity to femorally drift, then you are probably not quieting it down as much as you might like. And again, we know that's difficult with runners, right? They don't yep. want to stop running. Um, but you have to have a quiet down phase. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, and 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 everything you said has, has really kind of reflects the a similar model that I that I try to run as well. Um, so yeah, and, and that you know that the uh, I think you mentioned steroid shots and and, and sends. like obviously like yeah, that's going to help calm down the inflammation, but we're not really fixing the biomechanical insult to that injury, right? So we need to make sure that yeah, okay, that's fine if you want to help with the symptoms. Same thing with other modalities. I'm the same way. I don't really use a lot of modalities anymore. But if people are in pain, part of our job is to get them out of pain, right? And, and make them feel better. Yeah. Um, so you know, some soft tissue work, some stim, some, you know, whatever it is that that calms that area down and, and allows the patient to be pain free. And then hopefully that gives you an opportunity or a window to um, induce some exercise, right? And try to correct some of the actual biomechanical flaws. Um, you know, I think that that's really what I got out of the paper. Um, any any other highlights you want to talk about from the paper that we didn't get to hit on? I thought that was really good. Again, my whole yeah. my thought process was more about really trying to highlight the fact that we got to look away from just where the, the area of pain is and really look at mechanics whenever we're talking about these overuse injuries, right? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And, um, you know, a couple other highlights, you know, when I when I learned this from Craig Denegar's talk, uh, and I did a little research and looked at Fairclaw's papers from 06, the first thing I did is I walked down to the cadaver lab, and I, I walked and knocked on the door of the cadaver director, and I said, hey, you got any, and, and the, the cadavers were all already dissected from our PT students. So, you know, um, First of all, it's hard to find a cadaver that dissected well with people that are doing it for the first time. And I remember, my God, this is what my cadavers look like when I was doing it, right? It's not like the ones you see in the anatomy books or in art. Yeah. Or sometimes, so you're looking, I said, do you have any knees that are in good shape that weren't really, you know, torn up too badly? And he found me one. So I didn't tell him what I was looking for. So he left me alone and I, I got my probes. And I'm looking through. And the first thing I did is I peeled back the IT band of this decent dissected knee. And underneath the IT band was this yellow thing and i have the pictures but i i can't share them because of cadaver lab rules state state yeah, of yeah, rules. yeah. But, uh, i shared it with my students uh, but not uh, uh anywhere publicly but yeah i i called him in and uh i said hey come here a second and he said what i said what's what do you think that is and he had no idea what i was looking for and i peeled back the it band is this little yellow thing he goes fat pat yeah i'm like not a burst he goes no that's fat pat i'm like he goes why i'm like Never mind. Okay. And he left and I kept digging around. And then <clears throat> I didn't know this because this paper didn't come out. I found, and I have the picture of tugging. I found those Kaplan fibers and I'm looking at that. And I, I called him back in and say, hey, Jim, what's this? And he goes, I don't know, some, some bands or whatever. He didn't know what they were. He's an anatomist. And then when that paper came out in Maritime Sports Medicine with the Kaplan fibers, I'm like, oh my God, 
I found those things, right? So again, this kind awesome. of goes back, goes back to the limitations we have, right? We're, we're being novices and, and we have so much to teach, right? So it's a lot of variables, right? So novice students are trying to memorize things. They're, they're sometimes absorbed or intimidated by the body if it's a cadaver, right? And they're worried about the oral practical exam. So if you combine what we think we know and what, what we know and what we want to test and the overwhelming, you know, uh, amount of information on the student, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? But to be able to dissect these slowly and carefully and, you know, not just like, oh, we don't need that. We don't need that, right? And we just cut the fascia away and be like, oh, we don't need that and get rid of it all. Now we know fascia has a really important role. So explore, you know, if you have opportunities, those of you out there listening, if you have labs and you've got a burning question you had about something that you learned or thought you learned as it relates to a diagnosis or pathology or treatment, if you have the ability to go back into a lab and, and look around and, and relearn and self-learn, um, now I kind of miss that now that I'm an associate dean, I'm, I'm kind of out of the classroom now, but you know, we have a PT program here and uh, at some point I'm going to be having this conversation because I know they teach this in the musculoskeletal stuff and uh, I'm looking forward to going in maybe for a day and having a little half an hour to to, to teach this to the PT students and you know that there's it's I've only to be clear when I when I wrote the first paper I've only actually tried this on one patient and, and it worked one of our assistant <laughs> soccer coaches at Ithaca came was referred to me and said hey you're the IT band guy I'm like oh well, I'm not really you, you are now <laughs> yeah I am now so uh he was training for a marathon he was a real fit young kid 30-ish you know and he was training uh, for a mini try or something so he's put a lot of mileage in. And so I put him on a treadmill. I mean, I did all my old assessment. I did the MMT and functional positions. I palpated and said, yeah, it looks like IT been related pain. And uh, every, everything, ruled out everything else. And I put him on a treadmill, had him bring the sneakers and had him run. And lo and behold, he started about 12, 13 minutes. He goes, yeah, it's starting to hurt a little bit. And I videotaped and he had a little tiny window. I'm like, okay. So then I gave him exercise to do. I told him to cut back on his running, blah, blah, blah. So I'm two, three more times to advance his exercise. It was very kind of off hands, right? He didn't come in every day. It was during the summer. And then I saw and then I didn't see him again. And then finally in the fall, I'm like, geez, I wonder what happened to that kid. I wonder if he, you know, if he got worse. Right? I hope it didn't screw him up, you know? And uh, <laughs> finally, like middle of September, he walked by my office and said, hey, I said, how's it going? He goes, good, good. I said, how's the knee? He goes, fine. I'm like, okay, well, tell me more. He goes, oh, yeah, I did my I did my try. It was great. And my knee had no pain. I'm like, well, it would have been nice of you to swim and tell me that, right? <laughs> right. Um, but it was like, whew, okay, good. I didn't make it worse, right? So my my experimental experience, if you will, with this is, is an N of one. So um, certainly there's more perhaps to be found, but there's a lot of encouraging studies that have looked at pre and post biomechanics, videotape before, videotape after, have based on a hip based program that I describe in the paper and patients have gotten a lot better and it's never going to be hundred percent. So, um, I think, you know, I think the main thing I'd like to put forth is, you know, beside all the technical stuff and, you know, it's a fairly long article. Um, it was a lot longer. The, the, uh, the folks helped me make it shorter, but is, you know, deconstruct things that don't seem to be working right and if we don't have best evidence and it's this pat and jim mckean wrote a great editorial in ijtt the editors of that uh, journal uh proposing the idea of internal versus external evidence right and the the reality is we don't have a lot of solid irrefutable external evidence in at right and a lot of things that we see it, it's we're, we're kind of late to the game but we're getting there we have a lot of great people doing a lot of great research but we don't have irrefutable external evidence and that goes to a lot of medicine what you do have is internal evidence so this paper is a combination to go back to my opening you know phil asked me about how i got into this it's really this 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 uh balance between internal evidence my experience my reflection right and external evidence uh pulling stuff from the literature right this works this doesn't work this is shown to work this is shown to kind of work right and then you come up with that strength of evidence uh uh re recommendations that i did at the end right and you know they're they're not they're b which isn't horrible which isn't great right? so some people might look at that and go oh it's only a b right it's only a level of b well that's you know i don't how many things do we have a right how many right. things are irrefutable use them all time so i'm a big context person yep so there's nothing here in this that will make somebody worse i don't think I don't want to say nothing, but it, yeah. it's highly unlikely that taking this systems-based mechanical hip proximal joint, you know, based approach is going to make somebody worse, right? Because it's, it's not an injection. It's not a modality, right? It's not a device. It's not a strap. It's not a brace, right? You're basically quieting them down, looking at how they move, addressing one of the links in the chain and slowly bring them back to play. There's really nothing to lose other than time. And I get it because that's a problem with, with serious runners. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah a couple of thoughts there. Um, one of my favorite quotes, I think it was George Box that said, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think this is a useful model, right? Like it, it probably is not a hundred percent accurate, but there's pieces of it that are useful to, to use in your daily practice. And then, like you said earlier, every patient is an N equals one experiment, right? Yep. You're, you're taking what you have in front of you and there's so many variables, you know, we, we can talk about the psychosocial, um, the biopsychosocial model, right? Like, I mean, there's so many variables that you have to take into account. Um, but again, it's just that N equals one, take pieces of models that you learn, utilize them, make them useful in your model, um, and, and just run the experiment until you get the results you're looking for. Um, so I think I, th I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all your, your valuable information with us. Um, obviously you know what you're talking about and have really dug into the research and I find that really, really valuable and appreciate it. So thank you. All lightning right, round. let's move on to the lightning round. So um, four quick questions, go as in-depth as you want or as scratch the surface as you desire. But what is your dream job if you're not already in it? Wow. Um, I guess my dream job, it's going to sound kind of nerdy, but the last seven, eight years or so of my career, I've really gotten into medical education. You know, um, uh, most of my reading now and my webinars and my conferences and all that stuff is, you know, all of the complex issues looking at, you know, competency based education and expertise and clinical reasoning. And I think if I could go back and if I had a crystal ball and some mentorship, I would have done a Ph.D. in health professions education and uh, would be working at a med school somewhere and just driving, driving the needle. And I'm doing it now in A.T., which I love. And I think we need more of it in A.T. to, to kind of catch up. But I think that would probably be my 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 dream job but it's probably not real sexy for for most people to hear i love that i love that i'm a huge nerd as well if you can't yeah. tell um but yeah what do you do for fun uh so uh i just moved to boston and uh it was a late summer move so my wife is still in ithaca with the house and so i'm in a small apartment here in boston i commute to work so i'm a city dweller adjusting to a very different world yeah uh, but uh my my muse is is road cycling Okay. So I used to live in upstate New York 16 years and three, four, five days a week. I ride my bike anywhere from you know 20 to 50 miles. And that's where I do a lot of my thinking and, and also socialization when I'm with people riding. So I love to bike ride. I love to hike outdoors. I love the mountains and the hills kind of stuff. Uh, I love to love to. My wife's a great cook. My boys are both great cooks. So we're kind of fruit foodies and whinies. So we, uh, we love to cook good food and uh, I like to travel. Um, I'm kind of philosophically inclined. So my books on my nightstand are pretty heavy. I like to read and think and push, push modes of thought, if you will. So those are kind of things that I do to keep myself balanced and, and moving and, and growing. Awesome. Love that, Paul. We, we will get along. <laughs> Absolutely. What inspires you? What inspires me? Um, my kids inspire me. Uh, two boys that are artists. Um, so uh, they're always inventing and creating and challenging me and teaching me new things. My my wife inspires me as a, as a beautiful person that's very kind and loving. So those have, have forced me to challenge to 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 be a new me as much as I can. People who know me well sometimes call me, you know, uh, Brickler or which is kind of a handyman or um, uh, another friend, Brian Riemann at Georgia Southern used to call me. Um, oh God, I can't think of the word. What's the animal that changes all the time? Uh, chameleon. Chameleon. Yeah, chameleon. So somebody called me a chameleon because I'm always looking at new things and trying to do new things. So um, the, I, come up with new ideas, you know, and, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a bench scientist. I don't have a PhD. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not great at math and stats and those sorts of things. That's my, those are my weaknesses, but uh, seeing things in different ways. If you look at my scholarship, whether it's education stuff or case studies I've done or the, the way the work I've done as an educator, I, I like to kind of take a Thomas Kuhn kind of uh, paradigm change approach to things. And I look at something, I'm doing it here. So I'm, I'm new as associate dean. So I'm, I'm in charge of PT, nutrition, behavior analysis, and health professions education. So there's no AT program here. So I kind of have one foot out of the AT profession, even though I'm still involved with the NHTA with uh, educationalists and, and the EATA with uh, the Education Summit and stuff like that. But um, you know, it's a big move at 56 years old to give up a tenure position and move to Boston and become an associate dean at a, 
at a university and get out of the AT field because I want to uh, see if I can take some of the things that I feel have been successful with an AT education and administration and, and put them to the test in, in non-AT um, domains. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, so what does athletic training mean to you? So it sounds like you've been in the field for a while, but, you know, we're getting out of it, even though you are getting out of it. You know, what does it what did athletic training mean to you? What does it mean to you? That's a, you may not have enough time for that one. Um, <laughs> so I've given everything I have to the AT profession. I started out as uh, real early days of one of the first um, clinic outreach jobs, 1987, Northern Virginia. I was in PT clinic and high school on my own in the afternoons and didn't really know what that meant. I'd never heard of that when I was in school. Had to kind of invent myself in that job, uh, how to juggle those hats. Um, the PT faculty I worked with, incidentally, my wife was one of them. So she became, I met my wife there, but, you know, they didn't really know what AT was, you know, and to be honest, I had just graduated. And I don't know if I really knew either, you know, yeah. authentically, um, as a new grad. So they were like, who are you? What are you? And I was like, who are you? What are you? You know, in sports medicine, we had orthopedists upstairs. And so, you know, that was before anybody talked about IPE and IPP. And you know, I read an editorial, I wrote an editorial on that and published it in Athletic Training Sports Healthcare, just uh, about my experiences with that. So <clears throat> then, um, you know, I've worked at three or four different high schools along the way uh, and worked at Georgia Southern. I worked with the World League. Uh, if you guys remember the World League back in then, so I've done professional sports in that regard. Um, I was the first non-golf professional to get approved by the PGA of America to do education. So I did a lot of stuff on golf mechanics and golf injury in the, in the 90s down in Orlando and did a bunch of education with the PGA of America and worked with the LPGA and a lot of tour players. So there's kind of all my brick allure kind of um, chameleon things coming out. But I've, I've reinvented myself a lot of ways. I never saw myself being an educator. Um, I never really saw myself being where I am now. So a little bit of imposter syndrome. But every step along the way i've tried to i've tried to push the needle with at um whether it's uh clinical practice whether it's you know our need to do clinical reasoning and our need to develop more expertise and not just say we're experts to actually have the evidence to support that we're experts in the things we say we are um i've been really ag aggressive for lack of a better word or progressive it depends on your your view with education in AT. Uh, you know, I, I wrote the petition a few years ago when the master's paper came out. I was that guy that wrote the petition that got a lot of flack. Um, the petition was basically to the point of, you know, we need to talk and listen more to the AT educators. And there was, you know, 800 people signed it in two weeks. So I wasn't the only one that felt strongly about, you know, um, we need to have a little different mechanism for how we advance our educational mission. So I kind of drove the idea behind the educationalist cabinet and community and Tori Lindley and I had some great conversations when he got elected and that's where that came from. So I've constantly tried to push the needle and, and drive AT forward in the ways that I can through education and through clinical practice and those sorts of things. <clears throat> and I think I've given a lot with one foot kind of out of the profession. Now it's a timely question because, you know, three, four years from now, I, I don't, I don't know how much I'll have time to give Keep, keep giving to the AT profession with my with my actual real job, but I want to, and I and my work. I don't think my work is done. I'm concerned about the profession, to be honest. I, I think we still have some some issues with cultural capital. You know, we're still spending a lot of time explaining to people who we are and what we are and what we're not. We, we should have resolved that a long time ago. I've been around a while. You know, the AT name you know, has come up. Should we call ourselves ATs or something else? You know, we I don't think we ever fully addressed that. And I think that's part of the cultural capital issue. You know, if we still have to explain to other healthcare providers who we are, we're, we're, we're still lagging, right? So it's not just about better salaries and better work conditions, which, which is key, right? But, you know, I, I wrote an editorial in JAT about who wants to go to AT school a couple of years ago. And that, that was the point is when kids start saying, hey, mom, I want to go to AT school, right? Because we're all familiar with kids saying, hey, I'm going to med school. I'm going to dental school. I'm going to PT school. And right now, more and more kids, I'm going to PA school. But how often do we hear kids, you know, bright kids saying, I want to go to AT school, right? When we hear that, I think then we've, we've made it and we've addressed that capital issue. When smart kids look at the profession and say, I'm going to AT school, and then they prepare. Now, now of course, they have to go to a master's. So that they, they set themselves up for an undergraduate degree or, you know, or three, 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 two combination program somewhere. But their intention, their target 
smart kids that want to be healthcare professionals, and not that there aren't any, but, but, but more and more of them, say, I want to go to AT school. And we start to hear that at the dinner table more and, and those sorts of things. Then I think we've, we've got the cultural capital, excuse me, that we feel we deserve and that those of us who have been in the profession know that we deserve. And with the master's degree now, the increased debt and the time it takes to get in the workforce, I, I'm, I've expressed this in numerous places for years. I'm really concerned about the how that's going to play out. 350, 360 accredited programs, you know, uh, competing for student not just butts in seats, but brains in seats, right? So everybody wants 20 students in a master's. Administrators need butts in seats to make the programs work. Everybody's fighting for a, a pool of students. We want students that are diverse. We want to increase the diversity. We, want, we don't just want people in seats. We want smart people. We don't want the smart people leaving. And to me, the, the most problematic way to phrase that is, you know, nowadays it pretty much takes six years, six plus, to become a PA, a PT, and an AT, right? Right? So if, if you want to be yep. in sports medicine, but you don't want to go to med school, you, you pretty much, you know... Kid says, hey, I want to be in sports medicine, but I don't want to go to med school. I don't want to be an ortho or a fellowship trained uh, GP, et cetera. Okay, well, you pretty much have three primary options, PT, AT, and PA. Well, now it's pretty much six years, six plus to, for each of them, right? Give or take a semester. The median salary for PA is $96,000 a year. The median salary for PT is seventy six dollars to $80,000 a year. The median salary for AT is forty six dollars to fifty. dollars So that, if we don't address that, Right? How are we going to get smart, dedicated people that are not only going to go to AT but stay in AT? Yeah. Right? To me, those are the difficult systematic issues that the AT profession needs to address quickly if we're going to not just survive, but as Tori used to love to say, thrive. I could literally talk on this for <laughs> another hour with you as well, and, and I completely echo pretty much everything you said. Um, I, I have those home, I have a lot of students that will come through. Um, we do not have an undergraduate athletic training program at Dickinson, but they're they're there for like bio or some type of pre-health and like, oh yeah, I'm really interested in athletic training. And you know, I, I have that honest conversation with them. I'm not gonna point them down that road if they don't truly understand what the, the profession is and what it pays, right? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times they do pick PT or PA over AT. And I completely agree, you know, with, with the the state of the profession and you know, I, I would like to think that I think we focus on the wrong. Well, yeah, let's not even go down <laughs> that road. I was going to say, I can keep talking about this for a while. Let's let's not turn this show into that. Um, but I completely I appreciate you you voicing that and, and completely echo everything you said there. Um, Phil, any thoughts to, to finish up before I do the outro? I, I think that might make a, another good episode down the road. I, sure. know, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree because cool. it's a big conversation. Oh, yeah. You know? And. Uh, part of my my work here when I took this job and I was a little leery of but uh, just a little but you know I, I'm an AT now I'm in charge of a PT program right and so again nutrition behavior analysis PT and health professions ed and that that's easy because I do that but you know part of my my thoughts were coming here okay what are they going to think of me that they're reporting to an AT right and so mm -hmm. I I I everything I do with them I think the reality is everything I do with them especially with PT right because there's tension between PT and AT and I've been around you know a long enough time. Uh, everything that I do with them, I'm sh there has to be some level of who's this AT guy, right? Who's this AT telling us X, Y, and Z? So, but to be blunt, you know, they have the same similar challenges, right? We're teaching students clinical reasoning. Their their salaries haven't gone up since they went to the DPT. They're confronting uh, actually maybe having too many students, and, and it's projected because some of the Sony PT programs too many students for the workforce in a few years. So they have some very similar challenges. Yeah, they have more cultural capital than we do, and salaries, and everybody knows what PT does uh, mm -hmm. compared to AT. But you know, I'm representing. I guess the point is, I'm, I'm indirectly because I still have AT on on my business card and and on my walls. I have a bunch of AT stuff. You know, I'm representing the profession to other healthcare professions, and so I take that that responsibility very seriously. And if I do my job well, you know, at least the, my local people, in, in a local sense, will be like, "Oh, wow, okay." So that's kind of what to go to your original question. What's always driven me is in my circles, my locales. How can I represent the profession of AT that increases cultural capital? Love it. Love I it. love it. Yep. Dr. Geisler, I uh, just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing all this with us. Like truly, truly passionate, obviously, about athletic training. And we appreciate you coming on the show and, and showing that to our guests. Um, it's been awesome to, to chat with you. And I just want to say thank you again. 
taking the time out of your busy day to share your expertise with us. Um, if any of our viewers have any questions for you, is there any way that they can reach out, either email or social media or anything like that? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. Um, you can find me at BomberATDoc. Um, that's my handle on Twitter. And my email is GeislerP, G-E-I-S-L-E-R-P, at Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S. Edu. Be happy to chat and share information and resources with anybody. Perfect. Perfect. Dr. Geisler, again, thank you so much. And I want to say a huge thank you to Sway Medical uh, for sponsoring this episode. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, share, tweet, post, comment, and DM. Until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. And I'm Philip Hensler. And this was the Pats Podcast.